come and go. They went inside just to look for Valentina, my granddaughter, but not to do any forensics or anything because their position is my daughter was murdered in Tijuana. For Vault Studios, I'm Reed Redman. And I'm Will Johnson. You're listening to The Daily Crime. A forensics excavation has been taking place at a construction site in Largo, Florida, after the Pinellas County Sheriff's Office received a tip about a 1980s cold case. Dana told me that her interview with 10 Tampa Bay about her mother's cold case just a couple months ago could have kickstarted this whole investigation here today. A timeline is emerging in the death of a San Diego woman who was found murdered last month in Tijuana as the FBI continues to search for her fugitive boyfriend on this side of the border. Adams has been described as a master of disguise. He currently is wanted by the FBI for questioning in the murder of his girlfriend, Raquel Sabian, in Tijuana. He must be totally out of his mind. I mean, he was always a narcissist, but violent. Until they capture him, the baby's not safe with any of us. I adopted a rescue dog recently. She's the absolute best. I can't imagine my life without her. And it was incredibly important for me to research the shelter that I was getting her from. And they were great. They have the animal's best interests in mind. And they're working hard to find homes for actual rescue dogs. I really wish I didn't have to specify actual rescue dogs. But here's the thing. If you're not careful, you can be tricked when buying a dog. On the upcoming season of Smokescreen Puppy Kingpin, Host Alex Schumann investigates the story of a secretive businesswoman accused of laundering puppies. Consumers thought they were getting rescue dogs, but without knowing it, they were actually supporting animal cruelty. The woman at the center of this has made millions, supplying puppies to people across America, sometimes even selling them without disclosing that they're sick. But now she's facing multiple lawsuits. Puppy Kingpin brings to light a side of our pet industry not enough of us are talking about while unveiling some shady truths about a con artist taking advantage of it. You can subscribe to Smokescreen Puppy Kingpin on Apple Podcasts to binge all the episodes, or listen weekly wherever you get your podcasts. Reed, tell us about this forensics excavation that's been going on this week in Florida. Yeah, well, so this excavation has been going on at a construction site for a new home, apparently in response to a tip, which we'll talk about a little more. But police responded to this location On Wednesday morning, our partner station, 10 Tampa Bay, has been covering this, and they actually flew a helicopter over the area, and that showed several sheriff's office vehicles, including a forensics unit at the scene. It also showed that much of the grass in the lot was overturned with dirt. Apparently, Habitat for Humanity was planning to build at that site. Now, the Pinellas County Sheriff's Office confirmed that detectives and forensics were there following up on cold cases from the 1970s and 80s regarding three missing women, Those women are Retha Hires, Margaret Dash, and Danielle Johnson. And Reed, are those cases that investigators believe are all connected? Yeah, so investigators have connected all three of those cases to one man that they say all three dated at different points. His name is Cleveland Hill Jr., and he's actually now deceased. Margaret Dash was the first of the three to go missing in 1974. Hires then went missing in 1982, and then Danielle Johnson vanished in 1989. None of the three have ever been located. So investigators believe, again, all three of these cases are connected to each other. Although Clearwater Police later clarified that detectives have no reason to believe Margaret Dash is specifically connected to the excavation that was taking place this week. And is there anything else at this point you can tell us about any of these three cases? 10 Tampa Bay recently profiled the Retha Hires case on an episode of their series, The Missing, It's a mystery that's haunted her family for nearly 40 years. Retha Hires left one night for groceries. So we do know more about that case than the other two. Retha Hires was a wife and a mother of six who went out to buy laundry detergent one day and then never returned home. This was back in 1982. So it's now been 40 years. And Retha Hires' daughter spoke to 10 Tampa Bay when they were covering this earlier this year. And she said that she remembered it like it was yesterday. I was home that day. I can remember her standing at the door, waving goodbye. And, you know, that was my last time seeing her, and I was 14 years old. Retha's car was found four months later in Clearwater, Florida. but There was no other sign of her. And again, investigators say that she was involved with that man that I mentioned, Cleveland Hill Jr. I need closure. 
You know, the families, three families need closure. I mean, it's, it's been too long. Someone in the community knows. Give us closure. That's all we want is closure. That's it. I want to put her to rest if she needs to be put to rest. Let me put my mom to rest. What else do we know about Cleveland Hill Jr.? Well, according to investigators, he was an asphalt contractor and a former minister. And again, he's connected to all three of these cases because he had apparently dated all three women. 10 Tampa reported back in 2008 that Cleveland Hill Jr. had shot his wife and mother-in-law in 1968 and served prison time for those crimes. They also reported that he was sentenced on drug trafficking charges in 1992. He was released from prison in 2008. And as I mentioned, he has passed away. He later died in Virginia. And he died without ever facing charges in connection with any of these three disappearances. Reed, getting back to the excavation that's been going on, has Tin Tampa Bay followed up with Retha Heyer's daughter this week? What has she had to say about the development? Yeah, they have reached back out. Ten Tampa Bay's Liz Crawford spoke again with Retha's daughter, Dana Hires. Here's more on that from her coverage this week. Dana Hires said she believes that the sheriff's office could find her mother's remains. She says she was contacted a few days ago by the sheriff's office about a tip they got about the possibility of human remains buried in this area right off Almerton Road in Largo. Now, Hires said her mother, Retha Hires, went missing nearly 40 years ago. The year was 1982. Dana Hires said she was just 14 years old when her mother was dating a man prior to her disappearance all these years, she hoped and prayed they would find her mother. Now, Dana Heyer said she believes the man her mom was dating murdered her. She also told me two other women he dated during that time period are missing as well. We don't have much information about the tip that led investigators to this property. But what Dana Heyer's told Liz Crawford is that she believes it was the result of her interview with 10 Tampa Bay and their coverage of this case earlier this year. She thinks that that's what spurred the tip. So that's Pretty much all the information that we have as of right now, but there will no doubt be more on this soon at WTSP.com. There may even be more information available by the time you're listening to this. Our listeners can also check out 10 Tampa Bay's coverage of the Retha Hires case from back in February, again at WTSP.com. The remains of a woman from San Diego were found in Tijuana at the end of May, and her boyfriend is now on the run Will, tell us about the death of Raquel Sabian. On May 31st, Tijuana police responded to reports of a foul odor coming from a car parked not far from a beach in Tijuana. Raquel Sabian's body was found in a red and white cooler inside a VW Jetta, her VW Jetta. That's according to David Sabian, who told CBS News 8 in San Diego that the autopsy showed his daughter's neck had been broken. 2008, white Volkswagen, like a sedan, and the container was red with a white top, and he put her inside. Now, Sabian's boyfriend, his name is Tyler Adams, and for a little background on their relationship, Raquel Sabian, 40 years old, had been living in a neighborhood in San Diego since around 2011, according to public records. About a year and a half ago, she met Tyler Adams, 50-year-old man who she knew as Paul Phillips. As it turns out, Phillips is one of more than a dozen aliases used by Tyler Adams. And they had been living together in San Diego. In November of last year, they had a child together, Valentina Sabian. And Sabian's mother said Tyler Adams seemed to be a great father and a great partner. Denise Hosking never suspected Tyler Adams was a danger to her granddaughter. She says he loved the seven-month-old baby. He was like no man I've ever seen. I mean, he was usually the one holding that baby. He would feed her. He would do everything. But at some point last year, according to Raquel Sabian's mother, the couple started arguing regularly. And on April 16th, Raquel Sabian posted a message on Facebook. And according to her father, David Sabian, that was her last message. Her father believes his daughter was murdered shortly after posting that message. The next day, her 2008 Volkswagen Jetta seen crossing into Mexico. Her father told CBS News 8, quote, on April 17th, they saw her car pass through Tijuana on the camera. They didn't see who was driving, but that was her mother's car, which she never drove into Tijuana. Her mother told her not to. There was no insurance on the car from Mexico, 
and she said she would not, end quote. What else has CBS 8 been able to learn about Tyler Adams, who, as it turns out, has gone by various names over the years? Well, we can go back to 2012 when Tyler Adams was sentenced in San Diego County to serve 14 years in prison. The charges against him were identity theft and aggravated white-collar crime, making a false financial statement, forgery, and buying and receiving a stolen vehicle. San Diego Deputy District Attorney Anna Wynn says at the time he didn't have a criminal history. This was his first case ever. I'm very confident that he had no criminal history. He might have done criminal things, but he had no criminal convictions. Deputy D.A. Wynn says she also learned about his history of aliases at the time of prosecuting that case. He had multiple identification cards with his photo and other people's names. He also had matching uh, car registrations, legal documents like that in other people's names. So again, this is back in 2012. He was convicted and sentenced. He was admitted to California State Prison. And then in 2016, he was released to the San Diego County Probation Department for post-release community supervision. Ultimately, however, he was taken to Hawaii, where he served time for a previous crime back in 2009. These were felony theft charges, so he was put back in prison in Hawaii. But then in May of 2019, he escaped, and then ultimately the next year an arrest warrant was issued in Hawaii for Adams for escape in the second degree. Now, Adams has been described, according to CBS 8, as a master of disguise, Family members say, in addition to using those aliases, he's also had extensive plastic surgery done in the past, right? Yeah, his stepfather, Donald Chafee, who's in Pennsylvania, says he first had plastic surgery as a teenager. He's had so much plastic surgery that he doesn't look like his pictures when he was younger. I gotta believe it'd be psychological. Why else would you have plastic surgery? I don't know. I thought he was a handsome boy, and maybe he thought he could change his his heart or his mind by changing his appearance. Now, neighbors in San Diego say he seemed odd and seemed to be changing his hair color in recent months. You know how when you dye your hair and you keep dyeing it and keep dyeing it and it starts to look very funny? And that's how he looked. He looked very funny with his hair like that. And then there were all of the aliases over the years. Kevin Schoolcraft is the name he was born with. And then he changed his name so many times. But the one that he liked the best was Tyler Adams because he was really close to his grandma. And her last name was Adams. That's why he took that name. You mentioned that Adams and Raquel Sabian had a child together last year. Do we have any update on that child who's seven months at this point? Is she safe? In June, early June, Mexican authorities, so this is after Raquel Sabian's body, her remains were found. Mexican authorities issued an Amber Alert for seven-month-old Valentina Sabian. A few days later, Tyler Adams messaged Sabian's family a, a video, a short video of the baby being held by a babysitter in Rosarito. And then in mid-June, so then a few days later, baby Valentina was found safe in possession of that babysitter who has not been identified. The infant was placed in protective custody in Tijuana and then ultimately returned to the United States, crossed the border and delivered into the protection of San Diego County Child Welfare Services. So at this point, what's the latest on the search for Tyler Adams? Adams was actually questioned by authorities in Mexico regarding Raquel Sabian, but was uncooperative. They didn't keep him in custody. And then Tyler Adams, also known as Paul Phillips, crossed back into the United States around 1.30 p.m. on June 16th using another fake name. At this time, it was Aaron Bain. The next day on June 17th, the FBI issued a news release and photographs of Tyler Adams seeking the public's help in locating him for questioning in the death of Raquel Sabian. One final note, on June 23rd, the victim's father told CBS News 8 he also has questions for Adams, who is now on the run, and he said... Why did you have to kill her? If you're having problems with her, why don't you just leave? Now look at what you did to your life. Look what you did to my family. Look what you did to your own daughter. All right. Thank you, Will. And thanks to David Goffertson at CBS 8 in San Diego, who's been following this story closely. Thanks as well to our partner station, 10 Tampa Bay, for bringing us our first story today. And thanks for listening to The Daily Crime. For Vault Studios, along with Reed Redman, I'm Will Johnson.